Welcome back to the Bad Bishop Chess channel. I'm Fide Master Alex, and here is another video you can get inside of the master's mind and hopefully improve your chess. And we are going to cover a blitz game against my friend rated about 1900 Fide. It's exchange variation to Karo Khan with White's inaccurate move Knight F3, while the point of the variation is to restrict Black's light square bishop. Now it is able to choose g4 or f5 square. I know many of you would be thinking to fast forward until the Kalsba structure is formed and the minority attack launched. I'm asking you to hang on for a couple of moves more, cause soon there is going to be a real chaos. Typically this 95 happens a bit later in the game and that's why I'm spending time trying to find a way to punish it. I concluded that there is no reason not to trade the bishops. Here I was thinking if white takes on c6 I'm more than okay after b takes c6 since the pawn moves towards the center. Therefore a move like knight f6 is fine. But I opted for rook c8 which doesn't work well with the minority attack which should be black's main plan under this pawn structure cause it is asking for the a8 rook to go to b8 at some point to support the b pawn. Nevertheless, I played it because of the tactical threat on d4, thanks to the c1 bishop being exposed on the c file. This causes white to do something about the threat on d4, including even a possibility to trade on c6, and that favors black. I think I would not have done that in a longer game, with more time to think. f4 is not a terrible move, but it ignores the threat on d4, and it looks like I can take the free pawn without too much of thinking. WRONG! <laughs> it is a critical moment. If it works, the game should be mine. If it doesn't, I may lose my knight. In this kind of positions, one should stop and think longer. I was calculating what if white takes the knight and I grab the bishop and then the rook. There is queen b5 check and I have no way to escape. Check the engine's suggestions. Knight d4 is not even among first three options. Nonetheless, I opted for it anyway because I saw that the rook doesn't need to take on h1, but sacrifice itself on c6 to cover the a4 ea diagonal, and the outcome seemed fine to me. A point down, but white has no right to castle. The d4 pawn is weak, there is an outpost on e4, and my opponent's dark squares are weak on the king's side. For sure, taking on d4 is by far the best option for white, but they probably didn't see the queen b5 check that comes after losing the h1 rook, and instead play the move that accepts the sad future. Now, f5 seems like a typical escape square, but let's not forget about the queen b5 threat. Therefore, either queen b6, thanks to the hanging white c1 bishop at the end of the line, or knight c6. In these positions, black should only care not to allow white to gain activity along the e and f files, thanks to the f4, f5 pawn break. I wanted to prepare my pieces to counter such attempt or make f4, f5 difficult for the opponent to play. That's why we had bishop to d6. Now white needs first to deal with the threat on d5 square and there is no easy way to do it. Taking on c6 is done for the reason that the a7 pawn is going to be undefended at the end of the line. And I was not at all concerned in regard of losing that pawn because it takes too much time to get back the bishop into the game. But then I realized there is c5 closing the way out for the poor thing. I was expecting here b4. At first it looks like a beautiful tactical trick to free up the a7 bishop thanks to the queen b5 check winning the bishop on b4. But luckily there is queen d7 and black emerges with an extra pawn at the Queen a6 is making things only worse, since after rook a8 at some point, the bishop is going to be not only trapped, but also pinned. Now not seeing how white is able to make any progress in helping their poor long range piece, I decided to castle. It is possible that even here, sacrificing on b4 is better in order to help the bishop, but instead white went for a more stubborn defense. 
Queen d7 prior to rook a8 is one way to do it, since an immediate rook a8 may be met by queen b7. The pieces are almost ready to be piling up against the poor thing, but first I needed to defend the d6 bishop and that came with a tempo. Rook a8 is now preparing the move bishop to b8, thanks to the white's queen being on a wrong file. They opted for b4, but it came too late. Computer doesn't agree with me playing bishop b8. It sees a line where white sacrifices the queen in order to reduce the damage. However, the game is completely winning either way and I didn't care is it minus 10 or minus 6.5. f5 should not change anything. Almost all their forces are on the queen side. You shouldn't be worried when this is happening. I even tell my students to welcome those moves and sometimes even think of how to go for the counterattack on the same side. Now, king h1 to run away from the discovered check. And queen b7 to defend the a8 rook so the bishop may discover an attack against white's queen. Now the idea was to force trade of queens, simplify and easily win the endgame. And since white queen cannot reject the trade offer, the move deserves to be rewarded with an exclamation mark. a4 trying to get the pawn as far as possible after trading the queens, but it doesn't really work. I could have taken on b5, trade a pair of rooks and play rook b6 with a winning endgame. Instead, I traded first on b4 to secure that white ends up with the doubled b pawns at the end of the line. However, white could have taken on b4 using the queen, which they kind of missed as well. You're probably thinking there is no reason to watch this further. I felt the same way while playing, and in those situations I tend to enter the mode of trying to demolish my opponent in such a way that they feel disgusted by their own position. And I'm asking you to hang on, because you'll see how this attitude affected, in a negative way, my gameplay. We'll fast forward until that moment is reached. That's about 15 moves from this position. And here it is, white has nothing better to do and sacrifices their rook for the pawn. I started thinking there is a forced draw cause of the stalemate, completely missing presence of the pawn on g5. Is there a way to avoid perpetual checks cause their rook is going to keep checking me until I get bored and take it? King f2 fails due to rook f3 and king e2 cause of rook e3. So I opted for king f4, then rook f3 anyway. King e5 and rook f5. I started to think of a stupid impossible idea of hiding my king all the way to g8, h7 and g6. But they should be good with rook e5 and now I'm either losing my knight or seemingly stalemating them. Now look at this. White suddenly stopped using the excellent fake stalemate trick and switched to the usual regular chess which is the same as immediately resigning. Have you ever been in such situation in which your opponent, who is completely winning, have a stalemate illusion and you start using it for your benefit, but then, without any reason, you just stop and surrender? And try to read the body language and guess what is said just after the game is finished. There is no dilemma what the two players are telling each other, with me still not being aware of the fact that it was not a real stalemate situation. 